Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Mitchell Kaplan, Miami Book Fair, and all of us at Books and Books, I welcome you to a virtual evening with Robbie Arnett to discuss The Rain Heron, a gripping novel of myth, environment, adventure, and friendship published by our friends at FSG. Robbie Arnett is the author of the novel Flames, which won the Margaret Scott Prize was shortlisted for the Victorian Premier's Literary Prize for Fiction, the Guardian's Not the Booker Prize, and the Readings Prize for New Australian Fiction, and was longlisted for the Miles Franklin Literary Award. In 2019, he was named a Sydney Morning Herald Best Young Australian Novelist. He lives in Tasmania from where he joins us this morning, our night. To moderate tonight's conversation, we're joined by Jeff Vandermeer. Jeff is the author of Dead Astronauts, Born, and the Southern Reach Trilogy, the first volume of which, Annihilation, won the Nebula Award and the Shirley Jackson Award and was adapted into a movie by Alex Garland. Jeff speaks and writes frequently about issues relating to climate change. His new novel, Hummingbird Salamander, is forthcoming in April. Okay. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by clicking the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen, and you can order your copy of The Rain Heron from Books and Books below by pressing the green button. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Hi, Robbie. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, I just like to, uh, uh, before we start, I start asking uh, uh, Robbie some questions about his amazing book to thank the bookstore for hosting this event and Christina for that lovely introduction, uh, as well as to the Mommy Book Fair, and of course to all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, there's a lot to say about the rain heron. One thing is that it's an extraordinarily beautiful book. Uh, I, I, I've rarely seen a cover that magnificent. Um, what is it about? Uh, it's about a lot of different things, but at base, it's about a woman who has fled to a remote part of an unnamed country devastated by a coup, and there, surviving by hunting and farming, she lives quietly until an army unit arrives searching for a half-mythic bird, the rain heron. And the heron is reputed to be able to change the weather. And the lieutenant in charge of the army unit, a woman named Harker, is dogged and determined, despite Wren, uh, our protagonist to begin with, protesting that the heron doesn't exist. And from that initial conflict, the novel opens up in beautiful and harrowing ways as Harker is determined to break Wren and Wren is determined to lead her away from the rain heron. And it opens up not just forward in time, but also into the past uh, with the weather changing uh, rain heron at the center of it all. And it comes to a conclusion uh, in all of its parts that, 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 that come together in such an interesting structural way, uh, satisfying, gorgeously messy and complex. Uh, it, is, it is not uh, a book that ties up all the loose ends in, in a way that I, that I tend to dislike, but it also gives you a satisfying ending. Uh, and as someone who has found his attention uh, fractured over the last year in terms of reading, uh, I was really uh, appreciative of, of reading something that was so seamless in, in the sense of seeming like a, an instant classic. Uh, so maybe we'll start uh, with a, a big question, Robbie, if you don't mind. How did this miraculous uh, creation, uh, the rain heron itself, come to you? Oh, thanks very much, Jeff. Um, it came to me in dribs and drabs. I, I really didn't come fully formed. Um, I knew I wanted to write something that began as a fable and then tie that into some story that related to the natural world and into something that felt like it could be the modern day. And I played around with lots of different things and I ended up gravitating towards wanting to create some kind of totemic animal um, that had a myth or fable behind it that linked into something to do with the environment and weather. And I just messed about with it for ages. And the more I figured around with it, I realised I wanted to create something that captured both the savagery of nature and also the beauty of it. And the way something we see in the natural world can be really compelling and draw us in, but also it can be very, very dangerous. 
And it was also really important this fable or this creature didn't really care about people at all. Um, I don't really like stories where an animal has takes great interest in, in human ambitions or human stories because that's not the way animals work. Um, and I bit by bit and feather by feather, I cobbled this rain heron together. Um, and once I had it, I, I drew out the story from there, but that's how it all began. And did it feel like you were writing just another character in the book in a sense, or um, was it more like writing part of the setting that had come alive or? Probably the, the latter writing a setting that had almost a sentience and a, and a power and aura over the story. Um, I, I didn't want the bird, the rain heron to feel like another character that had relations with the other characters. I wanted it to feel something more than that, almost all encompassing. And it's a part of the book that the other characters hang off. Um, and it's central to everything that occurs. And I wanted this non-human element to be more powerful and important than the humans in a way, even if it didn't interact in a human fashion. And did the uh, idea of the rain heron uh, being sought by the military and just in general, you know, this idea of it being a weapon, did that come embedded with the details when you were first thinking of the story? Yeah, it did. Absolutely. Um, if, so, if a fantastical creature existed now, the very first thing I think would happen would be our governments would to try to capture it and understand it and uh, weaponize it if possible. Um, I didn't think that was too fanciful a concept. I thought that's exactly what a lot of governments would do. Um, and I thought it would be an interesting thing to play with plot wise to, to have something that feels like a story from ancient times and pair it with what feels like a potentially modern government um, who you can almost guarantee be inspired by it or be in awe of it, but very much try and turn it to their own ends. I don't think that was too much of a leap of the imagination. No, unfortunately not. Um, <laughs> and and I'm also curious, you know, it's it's set in an imaginary uh, country, or at least a never named country. Uh, and Sorry, Jeff, I just want to let Robbie know that his image has disappeared. We can probably still hear you, but you might want to refresh, Robbie. Cool, I'll jump in and out. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. There we go. There you go. Whenever that happens, we will be able to hear you, and your image should return at some point, but it just has to do with the strength of the connection. Sorry, everybody. I'm, I'm basically in Antarctica down here. <laughs> well, I was actually going to ask you about that. So you're in Tasmania, and, and the book is set in an unnamed country, but I, I know from reading uh, interviews with you and, and what you've said about your writing that Tasmania is really influential on it. So I'm curious, first of all, what it's like in the area of Tasmania where you live. And it's the end of summer right now, right? Um, yes, it is. Um, what is summer yeah, we... in Tasmania like? Uh, not your typical Australian summer that I think um, many people associate. There's no deserts or outback here. Um, it gets to around, oh, I'm not sure Fahrenheit, but around 25, 30 degrees Celsius. So um, it's warmer than England, but not as warm as the rest of Australia. And um, we get a lot of rain and winds. But where I live, there's lots of forests and mountains and huge big national parks. And um, I'll try not to go on too much because Tasmania is quite spectacular and beautiful. Um, Suffice to say, it's uh, lots of wonderful, beautiful nature that is very accessible. And, and do you think in part, uh, you know, I'm always curious about the, the role that uh, a writer's uh, relationship to place plays in, in their fiction. Uh, do you think there's there's anything about growing up and, and living in Tasmania that, 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 that's affected your perspective of the relationship between the human and the non-human? Because that, that forms a huge, huge part of, uh, of the book. Um, I think so. I reckon you're right. Um, I was really fortunate to spend most of my childhood uh, at beaches or on bushwalks or mucking about in the bush and uh, or going to friends' farms on, or hiking mountains. And um, I think that gets into you whether you want it to or not. Uh, I think I'm quite a descriptive writer as opposed to a discursive writer. And I just see a cat in the background. I'm worried mine's going to jump up in a sec too. Um, oh, sorry, that's our cat, yeah. No. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I, I think absolutely. I, 
spend a lot of time preoccupied with the natural world and because I'm surrounded by it all the time and I don't spend much time in big cities. So I think that filters into how I perceive things and how I write. I think you're totally right. And, uh, you know, so we, we meet Ren as the, as the novel opens, um, this woman who's basically tried to flee civil strife or civil war. Uh, and it's a, she's a very uh, compelling character to lead us into the narrative. But I also find myself, since I, I am kind of uh, addicted to reading about messy uh, characters to some degree and, and, and characters who are, are, are have issues, let's put it that way, um, I was really drawn also to Lieutenant Harker, uh, who, who acts in, I would say, very uh, in ways that are both harsh and sometimes oddly kind, uh, from her perspective at least. And uh, she's the one who has the mission of capturing the Rain Heron. And, you know, I feel like Harker is pretty much, you know, for me, was at the heart of the story. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about Harker and your thoughts about uh, having created this character and, and maybe also what uh, the reaction has been to this character uh, from, from the uh, Australian edition. Yeah, I, it was really difficult to conceive of her and, and put her on the page. Um, she's not really a very nice person at all for much of the book. And I wanted to create this character who wasn't necessarily a pure anti-hero, but as someone who has done terrible things and is yet somehow still redeemable and is someone who is understandable in the, in the awful things they do. I didn't know if it would work, but I was attracted to that idea of a sort of character. I didn't see the point in writing someone who was just good or bad. Um, like you say, I wanted to draw out these messy complexities and, and show that a person who's not necessarily an evil human being can do pretty awful things and then perhaps try and atone for it. Um, so that was how I conceived of her. And to put her on the page, I, I had to do it by putting her in contrast to the character of Ren, who's very much a solo, stoic sort of character, keeping to herself. And, and to put those two women in uh, almost combat with each other it was a way of drawing out the character of Lieutenant Harker. And then throughout the rest of the book, I was able to flesh her out in different ways as opposed to the sort of figure she presents at first, which is very cold and stony and implacable. Um, it was almost a writing challenge. and But I felt as much an instinct thing. I guess I just felt compelled to try and draw her out and, and flesh her out into a way where she's not neat, but she's messily and believable. I, I hope it worked. Yeah, well, it definitely worked for, for me. I found that absolutely fascinating, and and I think any time that you you both like sympathize with and don't sympathize with a character at the same time, sometimes in the in the same scene, um, it's it's really kind of a remarkable achievement. Now, another thing that I really appreciated was we have the 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 rain heron. We have uh, some really beautiful mythic almost mythic like writing especially the opening uh, which i think you're going to read for us later um or some portion thereof um and i have to say that i also though appreciated the violence in the novel uh and the cruelty uh which i thought was actually very effective at getting certain things across so i was i was curious um how you how you kind of like felt about combining things that might not necessarily seem like they fit together because the cruelty and the violence come with a, a kind of level of reality that the surreal elements um, I, and the kind of beautiful elements are, are different and they, they work for me. But I was curious how you thought about those, those two things together. Yeah, I thought very hard about it. It was integral to the book, at least for me and in the writing of it, because I wanted the book to feel like it existed in this very beautiful world, which is kind of stunning and beautiful as the world we live in. I find that unavoidable, so I wanted it to be unavoidable in the book. And the same thing goes with cruelty and violence. I wanted to depict in the book how the violence we enact on the natural world can bleed over into the violence we enact on each other. I find those things can be, happen at the same time a lot and there's lots of mirroring of things we do to the environment and we do to each other. And As an example here, where I live in Tasmania, have you heard of the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people like me turned up here 200 years ago and killed them all and made it go extinct. And as a result of that, there are um, millions and millions of kangaroos and wallabies in Tasmania because they no longer have a natural predator. So all our highways are absolutely littered with roadkill of wallabies. Um, it's unfortunately a very distinctive thing about here is you'll be driving through some of the most beautiful places you've ever seen and you'll see 
30 dead wallabies um, because their population is completely spun out of control. And so it's things like that driving around and seeing just this carnage of, of slaughter, which is an indirect result of uh, human violence set against the most stunning mountains and forests um, that you can possibly take a photo of. And it's things like that that were playing through my head. And, and while I was um, layering the cruelty into this book, I thought, am I going over the top? And I thought, no, worse things are happening in the real world anyway. So I thought it could make it fit. Um, and in that roundabout way is how I stitched it all together. Well, I, um, I, I, I really, you know, it sounds weird to say I appreciate it, but I really felt it was pretty uh, key in, in, in establishing believability for the setting, that it wasn't just this mythic kind of beautiful place, but it had this history. And this history was sometimes tragic and still playing out in, in, in the present. And that, that felt very, very believable. Uh, for where we are are today in some ways. So another thing is I was curious, um, you know, did you have to work at adjusting the levels of like what information we get about the setting? So we don't get names or anything. And I really love that. But I was curious if there was a draft where <laughs> you tried naming things and it just didn't work or, or how you got there. No, the other way. Um, in the earlier drafts, there was even less information. Oh, really? about <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to anchor the book in any way really specific. Um, I did have some drafts where there was more information about the military government of the place and more names of cities and things like that. But as I went back to it, I just thought, this is not important to the story. Um, it just felt like filler to me. Um, and I know that could be satisfying for some people to have that richer sense of the setting. But for me, the setting was the, the natural environments. That was what really mattered to where the story was taking place and that what that's what tied into the myth of the rain heron. Um, and as soon as I realised I was detailing how a military coup took place and what the names of the generals were and what their motivations were, I just didn't find it, just didn't find it very interesting. And I thought, if I'm interested in it either, um, yeah. Yeah. and I just had to I'd trust my instincts there. But um, it was a really fine balancing act between giving just enough information so it feels grounded and real um, and giving too much so that it becomes dull. Um, yeah. No, I thought it was. I thought it was great, and it reminded me, without being any way derivative or or influenced by uh, novels by Paul Auster and and uh, Peter Carey, where they use uh, something like that, and it can be very effective. So, uh, you know, given the nature of the the rain heron and the way you explore things like scarcity of resources in the novel, I mean, I, I think this is just an amazing novel about climate crisis, whether you intended that or not. <laughs> And so I'm curious, did you sit, set out in part to write a novel about climate crisis or did that just kind of? Yeah, I, in a way I did. Um, it was very front of mind for me. I thought this is something that is unavoidable uh, to me and to everybody. And I knew I wanted to write a novel that was very much steeped in a natural environment. So it seems silly to not even include it. And also I wanted to. But at the same time, I didn't want to come at it head on. Um, just because I feel there's, there's probably enough books and nonfiction going on at the moment which are very, very directly talking about the climate crisis. And a lot of them are great, and I'm glad they exist. But I don't think I didn't think that I was the sort of writer who could pull off a really direct, polemic sort of tome about it. I thought if I'm going to be writing about the climate crisis, my strengths would lie in a different direction and coming at it indirectly and tipping Kind of working through fairy tale and and myth, or also violence and conflict and things like that. I wanted to present it in a way where readers could make their own judgments and get their own ideas about it. I, I felt the book would be work better as a two-way conversation about the climate crisis. Um, that, yeah. yeah, I think that that's kind of how I conceived it. Because if I wrote a bit more, it was a bit more direct about it. I I don't think I would have done any good. Yeah, and I, and I, without giving too much away, I haven't talked very much about uh, one of my personal favorite parts, which involves uh, squid, which also happens to be something I've written about. And uh, I, I just feel like talking about that would, would, would be too much of a spoiler. But I have to say those sections and just the way that you deal with this relationship between the human and the, the non-human is just absolutely uh, amazing in, in those bits. So I, I'm curious if you uh, would care to give us a sample from, from the novel so that the audience can get a sense of, of, of just how... How wonderful this is, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you very much, Jeff. Um, I will, more than happy to. Um, I'm just going to read from the very start of the book, just the first and, couple of pages. And now you've disappeared again, Robbie. 
I'll just log back in and then yes. I'll start reading. Perfect. Drum roll. Okay. So this is the rain heron. Part zero. A farmer lived, but not well. If she planted grain, it would not sprout. If she grew rice, it would rot. If she tried to raise life, husk and choke and die before they'd seen a second dawn, or they were stillborn, often taking their mothers which the farmer had usually bought with the last of her coins and hope, with them. Success and happiness were foreign to her, and she had forgotten what it was like to go to bed unhungry. All she had was her hunger and her farm, and her farm, as far as she could tell, wanted her to starve. Her struggles weren't due to laziness or a lack of skill. She had been raised on farms. Her parents and grandparents had been farmers. And she knew as much about crops and soil and animal husbandry as anyone else in the valley where she lived. She worked hard and long under a harsh sun and in bone soaking rain. When she'd exhausted every technique she'd learned from her family, she turned to books, experiments, strange fertilizers, none of which helped. No enemy had salted her fields or cursed her name. She had no enemies. She was liked and respected by all the people of the valley. There was no reason for her farm's failure, yet her crops continued to rot and her livestock continued to die. Six years after her parents died and left her on the farm alone, six years of hungry, dismal failure, a black storm blew over the mountains and into the valley. Thunder crashed through walls, lightning licked trees, the wind grew fangs and chewed barns into splinters. Worst of all was the rain. Oceans of freezing sunshine heaved onto the farms of the valley, turning paddocks into lakes and ponds into seas. These wide waters soon swelled the river that ran through the valley, hastening its current, carrying away topsoil, crops, herds, fences and outbuildings. People took shelter in their stone houses as animals died outside in the chocolate flood. But behind their old thick walls, they were safe. Everyone was accounted for. Everyone but the unlucky farmer. After the storm stopped raging, it took a full day before the flood waters began to drop. Only then could the people of the valley venture out, in fishing boats and on upturned dining tables, to try to salvage their property. It was at the dusk of this day, a day of sorrowful searching, of fishing with colanders and paddling with hat stands, that they found her. As the weak sun dipped, a group of teenagers, piloting an ancient coracle, saw something strange in the limbs of an old leafless oak. Paddling nearer, they saw that it was the unlucky farmer, dead or unconscious, her body draped over the branches like a nightgown hung out to dry. But more curious than this was what they saw next. A huge heron suddenly emerging from the flood in a fast, steep flight, leaving not even a ripple on the water beneath it. With a languid flap of its wings, it came to rest in the crown of the oak, standing over the unlucky farmer, as if on guard. The teenagers brought their boat to a stop. This water-risen heron was unlike any they'd seen before. Any other heron, any other living creature. Its blue-grey feathers were so pale, they claimed later, that they could see straight through the bird. Its body was pierced by strands of dusky light, and the tree was clearly visible directly behind its sharp, moist beak. A ghost, one claimed. A mirage, said another. But before they could get closer, the heron hunched its neck, flapped its wings and leapt into the sky. A thick spray of water fell from its wings, far more water than could have been resting on its feathers. Then it disappeared into the remnants of the storm. The teenagers watched it vanish, not, what, not sure what they were seeing, not trusting their tired eyes and waterlogged minds. At that moment, the unlucky farmer rolled in her cradle of branches, coughed out a spurt of black mud and sucked at the air with great need, great violence.
that's from the beginning of the rain heron. Thank you. That's great. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, so I'm curious, uh, I, I want to ask a lot of questions about writing process, but I have at least this one, uh, just to satisfy my own, my own, my own curiosity, um, uh, about how you get to such, uh, beautiful but also purposeful prose i understand that you like to complete a section of a novel or a, a chapter or a scene and then continue on what i'm curious about is while you're doing that do you have like a plan of the whole structure either in your head or written down somewhere or is it completely a, a discovery a journey of discovery for you the whole way through uh, i have a kind of plan in my head um or written down as dot points on a notepad next to my computer um, but I don't have like a big wall of post-it notes and structure. <laughs> <You don't know. laughs> no, it's just chaos. Um, yeah. So I, I, I do have a plan, but it, it changes all the time. Yeah. Um, so I need to know somewhere that I'm writing towards with, with a longer piece of work. Um, otherwise, I'll just dither. But, yeah, it is probably quite organic and you know, the plan changes fairly regularly. Um, I, I like to leave those things open. That makes sense. So, uh, also, you're you're now writer in residence at the University of Tasmania, right? Yes. Yeah, I've been doing that for about three weeks now. Yeah. It's con congratulations. So, so now you're writing full time. I understand for on your third novel, right? Uh, yes. How is that different for you? I mean, does it does it feel different? Uh, are you already starting on the novel? Are you taking a break because you've got a book tour? Or... <laughs> no, it's it's a very Australian thing to to try and be. You know, ultra humble and say everything is uh, everything's fine it's not that big a deal but to be perfectly honest it's one of the best things that's ever happened to me um i've worked full-time ever since or i've either studied full-time i worked full-time ever since i left school um or both and writing novels was just something i did in the evenings or very early in the morning and just trying to cram it in um so now i just feel have these huge chasms of time to sit down and write um and it took me about two days to get used to it, and now I'm just having the time of my life. Um, That's great. <laughs> yeah, so I'm getting quite a lot done. Um, I'm sure at some point it will all come crashing down and I'll lose my mind. Um, but at the moment, it's, it's wonderful. I just feel incredibly lucky. That's awesome. So we'll open it up to audience questions in a second, but I would like to, to end this portion by testing your enthusiasm for various uh animals basically so so uh, i've done a little bit of research about tasmanian animals and i'm going to name a few in opposition to one another and you have to choose between them and then tell us briefly why you've chosen and and uh, hopefully i'll pronounce them correctly so the first one is uh, <laughs> a kind of melon called a patamelon or a flying quoll <laughs> well quote there's no such thing as a flying quoll <laughs> A you quoll. The test. <laughs> I will. Sorry. I will take a quoll, um, specifically a spotted tail quoll. Um, they look like a large cat, and they live in the trees. Um, they're um, they're like a Tasmanian devil, but they live in trees, and they're much prettier. Um, they're a stunning animals. Like if you want to Google spotted tail quoll, they're just beautiful creatures. And paddy melons, um, they're like a small wallaby, like the smallest kind of kangaroo you can get. They're everywhere. They're pretty boring. Like they're cute. Um, <laughs> But they're just, there would be, honestly, there would be about 20 million as mania. Um, so, uh -oh. and quite a are in danger, so I'll go a qual. Okay, all right. Um, how about wombat or Tasmanian devil? Uh, wombat. Because okay. um, Tasmanian devils, if you're camping in the bush and they start eating, they, they scream and you just can't sleep. But it's this unearthly, it's why they call devils, because the European explorers heard them speak screaming and thought there are demons here um so purely for the basis of getting to sleep um wombats wombats okay and um little forest bat or large forest bat i understand these are things <laughs> um i think large because I, if you're going to be an, a mammal that flies the bigger the better um and you can see them you never see little forest bats um, so i go large Okay. And finally, a little more specific to your novel, uh, white-faced heron, southern calamari, or unicorn? Uh, southern calamari. Um, <laughs> I think definitely southern calamari. Um, yeah. I, I like how you've you, you've named a species already as a a, a dish as well. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so, so on that that note, I think it's time for audience questions, and and thank you very much for for putting up uh, with those last ones. I appreciate yeah, it. Fun. Thank you very much, Jeff. So we seem to have a very shy audience because there aren't. There's just a hello, but there aren't any questions yet. So we'll, we'll both sing if if you. Don't let's have remind questions. folks that are watching that we would love to have some of your questions, and all you have to do is go to the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen and put those in. Um, and if not, you will be subjected to their singing. <laughs> so I, I can't speak for Robbie's singing, which might be spectacular. <laughs> um, but I do have a question, actually, in, in the interim um, about the novel that you're working on now. Is it another one? I mean, and I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't read your first novel. So I don't know if the structural thing that you did in Rain Heron is, is something that you, you usually do or, or not. But what is the third novel like? Uh, the third novel is... Um, at the moment, quite um, straightforward, mm. almost um, realistic historical fiction about well, with quite a few slants and twists on it because I can't help myself. Mm. Um, but it's really just based on stories my grandfather told me while growing up. Um, he had a really interesting childhood on the banks of a river here in Tasmania um, where he was madly trapping and shooting as many rabbits as he possibly could to sell them because their pelts were turned into hats into the army. And his two older brothers were fighting in the Pacific in World War II. And he was, he thought he'd be called up there and he really wanted to own his own boat before he went and got killed in a war. So he almost didn't sleep for a whole summer while killing as many rabbits as he could in order to buy his own boat. And his whole kind of family was disintegrating around him while he was on this mad quest. And the way he's talked about it, it just, I just thought I could turn that into a book. Yeah, you wouldn't um, even have to make it. Wow. Yeah. That's amazing. And, uh, yeah, so he was kind of roaming all through this valley doing that and barely at home. And he, he just would tell the story in a, in a fascinating way, a story of obsession and masculinity and, and fear of death. And so I thought I could probably turn that into a book one day. And so I'm going to do it. Brilliant. <laughs> so we do have some questions now. Um, so Jeff mentioned this earlier, but I'd love to hear you both discuss the sense of place more in terms of the environments in which you both live and how that informs your writing, but also how that might be persuasive in this age when so many people are climate change deniers. Yeah, um, Jeff, I'm happy to have a go at that if you'd like. Go ahead, please go ahead. Sure. Um, I think sense of place is incredibly important. Um, and I think it's really important to fiction as well. Um, whether it's a city or a built environment or a natural one. Um, so I think I can't help but be drawn to writing like that. I think it, it comes into my fiction because it's the only way I know how to write. And it's the only thing I feel really passionate about when writing. Um, my nightmare is writing scenario. It's three or four people sitting around a table in a bar having a conversation. I think I'd, I'd run out of the house before knowing how to write that. Mm. Um, and when it comes to this idea of climate change deniers, um, what I think is really important for a sense of place and natural world in fiction is that it allows us to think about the real world in imaginative ways. I think that's a really powerful thing that the stories in fiction can do. So while facts and data and real can not only be overwhelming, but also can make people kind of get their backs up a little if they don't agree with it for whatever reason, I think the great power of stories and fiction is that it can help us think about the real world in different ways and see things from a different angle. Maybe not straight away, but the way a story can embed itself in your mind and fiddle about in there for a while and it can help you see things through different lenses. Um, and I know that sounds a bit prosaic, but I actually think it's quite important. So in terms of sense of place, I think that's what that does for me a bit. I know, Jeff, I don't know what you think I might be. Waffling. No, I think I totally agree. I mean, uh, I think that I like my novels to live in the reader's body, too. Uh, and you do that in part to the description because the description is, in, in, to my mind, always part of the characterization because whatever you're seeing is basically filtered through the character's point of view. And, and if you're doing a very, uh, you know, very interior character, then you're, you are viscerally, uh, hope, hopefully, affecting the reader. And so you don't need to worry about being didactic. You just need to worry about making them live in a, a different space and hopefully that uh will will we'll get 
get people thinking about certain issues. I know, for example, in the rain, rain hair, and I, I saw some really interesting ways that you were dealing with uh, the, you know, how we deal with animals as commodities and, and how that can be a, a, a humane or an inhumane thing and how that affects, you know, how we over fish, for example, with that is one, one example. So you don't need to put anything that, in there. You just have to describe, you know, what, what's going on. Uh, and, and then also, like you were saying, novels uh, can be a laboratory. There are things that you, you'd never think about doing <laughs> uh, that you can write about uh, or experiences that you can, you can, you can have. And, and I think that, that also can, can help people put, uh, put people in the right headspace. For, for those who actually uh, are not deniers, but maybe think it's 50 years off and you have to convince them that we need to do something now. So, Yeah, we have, we have lots of climate change deniers in our parliament, so I can't I'm think about it. About that. That. Yeah, so, I, yeah. Yeah. Um, so here's a question from Wilson. He's asking... I'd love to hear more about genealogies, if that makes sense, of this novel. Which works are its ancestors or predecessors? Yeah. Um, this might sound like a bit of a left field for everything we've talked about with the book, but one book I think that this, The Rain Heron, is actually in conversation with structurally is A Visit from the Goon Squad by Jennifer Egan. Um, in terms of the structure of the characters to pick up from chapter to chapter. Um, I read that while at university and I just thought, not only that it was hugely enjoyable, I just thought this is so clever the way she's done this. I wonder if I could ever write a book like that. So in terms of structure, I think a visit from the Goon Squad. Um, in terms of other inspiration, um, there's a UK novelist called Jeanette Winterson. Yeah. She writes, uh, I think she writes mythically real stories really well. She has a book called The Passion um, which is set almost in the Napoleonic Wars, but it has this huge mythic, almost fable-like feel to it. So I thought a lot about the passion. Um, and beyond that, there's there's lots of probably obvious ones. Um, for me, there's the Booker Prize-winning Tasmanian novelist Richard Flanagan wrote a book called Gould's Book of Fish, which is almost a retelling of Tasmanian colonial history, but it's all completely made up, and only so it, none of it actually really happened, and there's all these sets of it that that are real and so that was another book that made me think this is a way of writing about the real world in a way that's totally left to field and totally entrancing so without going on too much i'll probably name those three um and not to be too much of a suck up but the southern reach trilogy too uh was really really influential too particularly the gothic elements as well um, <laughs> it's too kind winterson's amazing though So here's a question from Susan. How has the coronavirus pandemic affected your process? Any chapters about Zunuses in Rain Heron or forthcoming? I'm not sure what Zunuses are. I'm sorry. Maybe you know. Um, uh, type of virus, I think. Maybe got it. Zoovirus or whatever. Zoo, yeah. Got it. Yeah. I mean, I was really lucky that I'd finished the Rain Heron before um, the pandemic hit. Um, I don't know how I would have finish the book otherwise um but I, I feel guilty saying this uh, i'm on an island at the bottom of the world and we essentially have a really big moat so we rode out the pandemic quite well um and we haven't had any coronavirus in tasmania for about eight or nine months um so i'm just very fortunate um the rest of the world is falling around around us and i'm just stuck on this island um so process wise all this changes i'm just stuck here and can't leave um but otherwise, it's it's all been okay. Um, I, yeah, I, I feel really guilty even talking about coronavirus because of the way things have gone well down here. Um, but otherwise, yeah, everything's been okay. So Aaron would like to know, why did you choose two females to be your main characters? Um, I get asked this question a lot, and I really enjoy it. Um, I didn't really set out to write about women in particular when I started writing the book. I didn't perceive it as a specifically um, female or feminine um, story. But when I created these characters of Ren and Lieutenant Harker, the more I fleshed them out, and this might sound like a cop-out, but they just felt like women to me, particularly in the way they behaved and the interactions with each other. I thought if I'd had... So Ren's a 50-something woman living in living as a hermit on the side of a mountain. 
I thought if I'd written that as a male character, I wouldn't know how to do that without it being this stereotype of almost the great white hunter who's man against wild, who's toughing it out alone out there. And I just didn't like that character. Um, but when, as with Ren as a woman, I felt like she embodied all these kind of stoicness and and this version of resilience that I associate with women. I come from I, a women, um, my grandmother and mother and aunts and sister and fiance are all really important in my life. And I've been very influenced by a very matriarchal sort of family. And this idea of stoic resilience just felt much more real to both her and then Lieutenant Harker as women. And versions of them I wrote in other drafts as men just felt boring to me um, and kind of unpleasant in a way that I find hard to describe. So once I'd done that, I just had to make sure I did it as well and as faithfully and best as I possibly could. I knew I was perhaps running a risk um, because it was a problem of a man writing about women not doing it very well. Um, I just had to trust myself that I'd, I'd do a good job because the characters felt more real that way. Um, and then I just had to go with it. So it might have been a bit of a risk, but it felt like the right thing for the story. What a great answer. Um, so here's a question for both of you. What's waiting in the TBR pile? Oh, you go, Jeff. I'll, I'll go have a look. Uh, <laughs> uh, gosh. Um, I'm reading a book called Lemon right now, which is about a man who eventually has an obsession with a lemon. <laughs> It's the only one I can remember. Um, and it's actually quite good. It's it's quite hilarious. Um, I wouldn't say it's particularly relevant to our moment, um, but but it's a kind of a dark comic uh, masterpiece. Um, uh, and, and and then there's, there's just too many piles of books in the other room to really really answer that question in any coherent fashion. Yeah, I'm about to read Hurricane Season by Fernanda Melkor. Um, I think she's a Mexican or South American writer. I'm not totally sure. But it's come highly recommended. So Hurricane Season is next. Um, then after that, The Absolute Book by Elizabeth Knox, a New Zealand writer. It's been getting all these raves and a friend of mine just pressed it into my hands. So Hurricane Season and The Absolute Book. I have a hummingbird salamander galley in the TBR pile. Ah. I've got one on the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I, I know I can't wait. I can't wait. So we'll wrap with one more question for both of you. Who are some of your favorite authors? Um, and that's, I guess, related to what we just said. But I no, not really, because they don't have to be authors you've read before. Yeah. Um, well, I guess I, I'd stick it again with Richard Flanagan and uh, Jeanette Winston. Who I'm huge, huge fans of. Um, they're big big influences on me. Um, well, I think Annie Prue is almost my favorite writer. Um, her descriptive prose and stories and characters, I just, every time I read one, I just kind of get bored and then pissed off about how good it is. Um, so Annie Prue is someone I keep keep on coming back to. Um, and another one for you guys to check out, um, Ryan O'Neill is a really funny Australian writer. Um, he's very underrated. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Annie Peru, I'm pretty amazed by her. Well, I really like this book <laughs> and this author right now. Um, and, uh, and also I think that anytime that Charles Yu has something out, I, I always, uh, I always love it. Um, so, so that, that's an author that I highly recommend. And Winterson, I, I, I totally, it, it reminded me that I'm a couple novels behind, so I need to catch up. Yeah. You know, Jeanette came to Books and Books right before the pandemic. Mm. Well, a little. And she um, she had this whole performance that she had created around her book, Frankenstein. And it was phenomenal. We The booksellers all had to take part and we had to like get the timing perfectly right. And we just had so much fun with her. She's, she's wonderful. So I wanna thank you both for joining us. Robbie, congratu congratulations on the novel. Uh, we hope to sell many, many copies at Books and Books. I want to remind everyone watching 
that you can order your copy by just hitting the green button at the bottom of the screen and we'll ship it right out to you. If you're in Miami, you can come by and do a curbside pickup. And um, I hope that we will see each other in person soon at Books and Books, uh, maybe for the book fair sometime in November, hopefully by then um, you'll be able to, to travel. And I just thank you for being here tonight and for sharing your work and thanks to all the viewers watching from everywhere. And if you have any final words you'd like to say, now is the time. Oh, um, I would just like to extend my profound thanks uh, to you, Christina, and especially to you, Jeff, for doing this for me. Um, I've tried to do a good job of not just being a fanboy over Jeff, so hopefully that's come off all right. Um, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you. you, everyone, for watching. Um, yeah, hopefully I can come to America one day. Um, I would really love to. Stay so, away from now. <laughs> I really love to. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone, or good, good morning. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.